So, man, it's great to have everybody here today. My name is Ryan. Brett was not lying about that. Uh, most of the other stuff, you can't believe a word that comes out of his mouth. Um, did I say that out loud? That was the thought. So, no, no, uh, we were having a great time today. We had a great series. This has been wonderful. If you haven't been able to be with us or if you missed a week or two, go on the website, check it out, uh, listen to the stories of what God is doing in people's lives. And it's really our series anchor verse that's kind of kept everything centered is found in this little letter in the New Testament, Ephesians, and in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. By the way, if you're new to Bible study, inside of your Bible you have these big numbers and you have little numbers. The big number is the chapter, the little number is the verse. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, just kind of those chapters and verses were added later. They weren't, when these letters were written, you know, like Paul didn't write, okay, here's a new chapter. Like that didn't happen. That happened later on uh, so that we all could sit in groups and kind of find the right spot. So that's what those big numbers and little numbers are in the Bible if you're kind of new to this Bible study thing. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, it says this, now all glory to God, which just simply means let's give God all the credit. Now, all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. And we've been hearing stories about how God has done infinitely more than we ever thought he could happen. Now, here's the problem with stories. Like, I'm just going to, can I, I'll just confess to you. Sometimes we hear stories and we hear what God is doing in other people's lives and we get a little depressed right? We get a little irritated. Like, why isn't God doing that in my life? You ever feel that way? Like, do you ever hear like, no? Okay, just me. Well, I guess the sermon today is for me. So uh, just, it'll just be me up here talking to myself, you know, but I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I hear what God is doing in other people's lives and I get jealous. Like I get frustrated. I get depressed. Uh, this happens to me like when I was a, a not, not a young pastor, but like earlier on in my career, I would go to these conferences and you'd, you'd hear about all this great stuff that God was doing in these other churches and, you know, how just all these thousands and thousands of people coming to faith and buildings and huge buildings and bigger buildings and all kinds of resources that they would have. And, you know, the first day you're kind of excited about it and it's cool. And the second day you're like, okay, we get it. You're really good. And then the third day you're just bitter and like, I get it. You're better than me and I'm horrible. And then the plane ride home, you're just depressed. What's wrong with me? Why isn't God using me? And you can get really irritated. And sometimes those conferences are not very practical at all. They just tell you all about the great things that are going on. And what I don't want this series to be for you is that. I don't want this series to be something very impractical. I don't want it to be like that friend that you have who is a master of the obvious. Anybody got a friend like that? You go and talk with them about something that's going on in your life and the bits of wisdom that they give you they think are so profound, but the reality is they're so obvious and so unhelpful because they're not practical. Does anybody have a friend who is a master of the obvious and they give you that advice, you just want to punch them in the face? Just raise your hand up and own that. Stick with me, right? So here's what that friend will say to you. You'll be angry. Your spouse will do something and you will think, I need to go talk to my friend about it, which I'm not saying is a, a wise thing, but you'll do it. And you'll go and you'll be all angry and you're worked up and that friend's gonna say what to you? Stay calm. What? Yep, yeah, stay calm. That sounds great, but what is it? And then they'll add this little word to it to just put like salt in the wound. Just stay calm. Like, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, that is so impractical. I, I, the fact that I'm talking to you is because I can't stay calm, right? There's got to be more to it. You go to talk to a financial advisor, talk to a friend. Man, I just need to get my finances in order. I need some help. I need some advice. Like, how can I turn my finances around? And they give you this little gem. Well, you know what? Spend less and save more. Again, like... What does this have to do with anything? Like spend less and save more. I need some practical things. I've known that, but how do I actually do that? It can be very, very irritating. Or one of these, like you're, you maybe are getting ready to have a baby and you go and talk to a friend of yours. You say, man, I'm just so worried about my kid. I want him to be, I want him to grow up, to be raised right. And they say, you know what? Just be a good parent. Just, just be a good parent. <laughs> Okay, well, how about practically? What does that look like to be a good parent? Or my favorite, maybe your favorite. Maybe you're not in peak physical condition like me. Why are you laughing? <laughs> maybe you decide, you know what? I need to get rid of some LBs. 
you think to yourself, I need to get in a little bit better health, get my counts looking a little better. So you go to that friend that you have who's always posted on Facebook all their exercise, right? You know that person. You hate that person. They're like, I ran 73 miles today. Friend that, like that, you know, like unlike, never want to talk to you again. I don't care how many couch to 45 Ks you've done. Stop posting it. We get it. You're fit, right? And you go to that person because you're finally like, okay, I, I need to go get some advice. And this is what they tell you. Well, you know what? Just eat less and exercise. Just eat right and exercise. I mean, it's, it sounds good, right? And it is kind of, there's wisdom there, but it's just impractical. It doesn't really have any teeth to it. And it just can frustrate us. You know, I get that I'm supposed to eat right, but I tend to just eat right now. And that's, that's as far as it goes. So, so what do we do now? The problem is it doesn't, this type of advice doesn't just stay in the realm of finances or parenting or, or tough situations. Like maybe you have that friend who's super spiritual. Like they speak all the spiritual language. And, and when you go through a tough time, you go and talk with them and they give you this gem. Trust God. And then because they're super, super spiritual, they go, just trust God. Or maybe they get really fancy with it and they say, you know, you just need to let go and let God. You've heard it. And you walk away filled. Just, like, just, I didn't even think about trusting God. That never crossed my mind. Trust God. I, you know what? What was I thinking? Right? I mean, it's a wonderful sentiment, but the problem is, how do you live that out practically? And that's really what I want to get in today is how do I learn to trust God practically? Because this series has really been about trusting God because that's the key for God's power to be on display in our lives. We have to learn to trust God. And so we heard that, but how do I do that practically? So what I want to do today is I want to look at a letter in the New Testament, one chapter in that letter, and this, and this letter is called Hebrews, okay? So Hebrews chapter 10, if you have your Bible, turn it on, power it up. If you got one of those old school paper Bibles, open it up, you know, grab your pen. Uh, we got talk notes there, you can follow along. And what I want to do is dig into this idea of what needs to happen in our life, practically speaking, so we can take those steps and trust can be built in our life? Now, as we look at the letter to the Hebrews, we have to understand that the first part of this chapter is really giving us some groundwork about a very important shift that happens in our lives. Like before we can get into practically living different, we have to grasp a concept. And so Hebrews chapter 10 opens up with trying to help us understand this concept. Now, the letter to the Hebrews is just that. It was written to the Hebrews, it was written to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people understood sacrifice. They understood that you went to the temple, you made sacrifices, you followed the law, you followed the rituals, and that was good. That was how your righteousness was ascribed to you. And so they had lived this whole life. And so the writer of Hebrews is trying to say throughout the whole Bible, listen, Jesus Christ is better than the law. Jesus Christ is better than the old way. And so Hebrews chapter 10, the writer is really digging in. And we don't know who the writer of Hebrews chapter 10 is. There's been great debate about this even since the first or second century. I know that really enthralls most of you. So you can Google that and read all about it. But we don't know who actually wrote it. Uh, but it's got some great insights in it. So let's look at this book. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10 for about the next 45 minutes to an hour, three hours. And uh, then we'll get you home in time for the games tonight for the, the March Madness. All right. So here we go. Hebrews chapter 10, first four verses say this. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. Whoa, this is a huge statement to the Jewish people. Like you're trying to tell me that the law of Moses wasn't it, that that wasn't what it was. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, listen, it's just a preview. It's a shadow. It's a dim shadow of what was to come, this new system. It's kind of like the preview before the movie. You know, you go to the movie, you got your popcorn, you got your soda, and you got your juicy fruit or juji fruits or whatever those things are called. I'm not much into those. I like the Reese's Pieces myself. So you got your Reese's Pieces. And what do they do? They show like two or three previews of movies that are to come. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, look, this law of Moses, it was just a preview. And see, the sacrifices under that system, they were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. He says, listen, all those sacrifices, and you have to know, if you're not familiar with this, 
Like the Old Testament, the, especially the first five books of the Old Testament, there's a couple of books in there, one in particular called Leviticus that was all about the law, all about the rituals, all about the things that you had to do, the sacrifices that you had to make, the ritual cleansing that you needed to go through if you did certain things or if you went to certain places or if you came into, count, into contact with a dead body. You had to do these certain rituals to stay pure in order to worship. If you sinned, you had to bring sacrifices, and those sacrifices were put on the altar before God. And this system, right, it, it wasn't able to perfect the worshiper. It wasn't able to do, bring about a perfect, true cleansing. And that's why it had to happen over and over again. And the writer of Hebrews says this, if they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshipers would have been purified once for all times, and here's the key, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. Their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices, what? They went on and on and on. And they actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So that's what they would sacrifice. They would, they would make a mistake or they would have to bring this, this ritual sacrifice. And, and it was this idea of worship. But, but Hebrews is saying, listen, the problem with that is all it could do is remind you of your sin. It could just put it in front of you. It could just remind you that you shouldn't be doing these things. It couldn't actually ever bring forgiveness. And that was the problem. See, the old system was about reminding people of their sin, reminding people of their sin in an attempt to get behavior change. But this new system, this new covenant that came through Jesus Christ was about a redeemer, was about one who came to redeem our lives and restore our lives. Hebrews chapter 10, if you skip a few verses in verse 11, it says, under the old covenant, that old system, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. Like these sacrifices can never do fully what needs to be done, truly take away our sins. Everybody say sin. Listen, you are a sinful person. You miss the mark. Notice I'm saying you because I am not. I am a professional Christian, professional follower of Jesus. I stopped sinning long ago. That's not true unless three minutes ago is long ago. Right? I mean, we're all sinners, and that's just a part of who we are, but forgiveness for those sins, right, couldn't take place under this old system. So again and again and again and again, they're sacrificed because why? Again and again and again, we sin. But the writer of Hebrews says this, our high priest, now he's saying our high priest because he's distinguishing this group of, of Israelites from another group, the other Israelites who have not accepted Jesus as the high priest. But he's saying, but our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, like Jesus came and he was this incredible sacrifice for you and for me. He offered himself so that we could truly, truly be forgiven. And, and once he offered himself, he was raised to life on that third day, and now he sits in the highest place of honor, and the Bible says in Hebrews, there he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. See, Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. For thousands of years, for about a thousand years, this, this sacrificial system it couldn't make people righteous. It could simply show them their unrighteousness. The law had no power to forgive. It could only show you here's where you went wrong and here's the consequences you have to suffer, right? Think about our laws today. You go, you speed. How many of you have ever gotten a speeding ticket? I'll wait. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. I was waiting for you. I knew very well. Now, when you got that speeding ticket, you broke the law. Did that forgive you of your <laughs> violation? No, it just pointed out what you did wrong and hope you change. Here's your consequence. Don't speed again. 
but you weren't actually forgiven. You're never forgiven of that. The law has no power to actually forgive that sin. But there was this one who came who took our punishment and offers forgiveness of our sins. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is so enthralled with because forgiveness was powerful. Forgiveness changed everything because with forgiveness came this reality. There is no longer a need for sacrifice. See, in Hebrews 10 verse 18, this is what it says, and this changes everything. It says this, and when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. So everything changes. Everything changes. You don't need to go in and offer sacrifices anymore. You don't need to go in and do those things. Why? Because you have been forgiven. And forgiveness changes everything. So practically speaking, this is the turning point. For the people of Israel in Jesus' time, forgiveness changed everything. It was forgiveness that changed practically how they lived every day of their life. And it's the same for you and for me. Once you and I receive that forgiveness, it changes our practices. It changes our priorities. It changes our day-to-day life. But until we receive that forgiveness, we're just going to continue to live in this system, in this mode that says, I'm not good enough. This mode that says, I have sinned. This mode that says, I don't belong in church. Right? You might even remember that. You might be sitting here today thinking that, oh, no. Nervous coming to church. I don't belong there. What I did yesterday. What I did last week. I love the story. If you were here last week, you heard Terry talk about her first time at this church. And as she came in, it was just really nervous. And what did she say she did? She went, she sat in the back. Right? She sat in the back. Guilty conscious. I got to sit in the back. I don't know if I should be here. The walls are going to. But as we're going to see in Hebrews, it talks about this change that takes place in us. That, that when we find forgiveness, that guilty consciousness goes away. Trust me, Terry's still a sinner. <laughs> she, that didn't change, but what she found, forgiveness. And with that comes, there, there is no guilty conscience. There is no need to recognize or say, you know what, I don't, I'm not good enough. I, don't, I, I can't earn my way. God has to love me because of what I do. All that goes away when you find forgiveness. And so now there's a shift that takes place in this letter, in this chapter. And the writer of Hebrews is going to give us some very practical ways to live now that you've been forgiven. So if you've been forgiven and you've accepted that forgiveness, now I'm going to challenge you today. Okay, so if you're our guest this morning, or you've been here for just a few weeks, what I'm about to do right now might seem a bit much to you. But if you've been here for a few months, a year, and you have received God's forgiveness, I'm going to be in your grill, okay? Because I'm just reading the Bible, all right? So don't get mad at me, but here's what it says. And this is what I want to challenge you with. Does your life look like this? Okay, so here's what it says. Let's make, let's make things practical. So here's what it says, verse 20, uh, verse 19 to 25. This is what it says. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. I love this. We can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place boldly enter. Now, listen, what this is talking about is what kind of what I hinted at, the shadowing I gave of Terry, right? Terry came in, she said in her story, I don't know, is the walls going to collapse in? I'm not really sure. Like her husband didn't really want to come in, didn't feel like it was dressed right. Am I going to make it? Is it okay? And there's a, there's a trepidness. And now after receiving forgiveness, after being reconciled with God, same two people walk into this building, still sin in their life but walk into this building with a boldness. Now, what this writer is referring to, this most holy place, in case you're kind of new to Bible study, this is talking about the temple that the Jewish people knew. They knew the temple as having three major components, an outer court, an inner court, and then the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was this little place where the Ark of the Covenant, which if you've seen Indiana Jones, you know what that is. If you haven't, it's a good movie. You should watch it. Not entirely historically accurate, but, you know, give you a good primer. The Ark of the Covenant, which they carried around with them uh, as they wandered the wilderness, the Ark of the Covenant was in the most holy place. And this was a place where the high priest, the high high priest, the highest of all priests, 
was able to go once per year to offer a sacrifice. And the, whole, the most holy place was separated by this massive curtain because inside the most holy place was thought to be the very presence of God on earth, unfiltered. On top of the ark, the lid of the ark had these two cherubim. They're like angel, angelic kind of beasts, and they have these wings, and the wings right where they touched, almost. Right there. Just in that little space, that was where the very presence of God was thought to exist. And so once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the priest would go in and offer sacrifice. Now, problem is this. You don't just walk into God's presence. <laughs> you know how Dave shared last week, if you were here, that story of like, whoo, like he felt God's presence right there and it was like a scary feeling almost. Okay, well, that was a filtered presence of God, experience of God, because an unfiltered experience with God results in something called death. And so the, the high priest on that day had to go through all kinds of rituals leading up to that day, and he would go into that holy place, and he would have bells on, a rope tied to him, because if he went in there and wasn't all set, so to speak, whoop, dead. Now, do you think he walked in there boldly? I don't think so. I don't think he looked forward to that day. <laughs> Like if you're the most high, if you're the, you know, the holy, the highest priest in the land and that's your job, if it were me, I'd be like, you know, I'm good. I resign right before Yom Kippur, right before the day of commandment, day of, day of atonement, let's let somebody else go. Like I don't think they sleep much that night before, probably no need for an alarm clock because this is like real, like life or death. Like I think they probably went in that day, got the rope on, got the bell on, they get to the temple. There's the veil. There's everybody. There's, the, there's everybody. Like, I think they might have been half in and half out. I don't think there was a whole lot of boldness walking in because you could think you did everything right. You could think you went through all the rituals, you did all the bathing, all the set, all the things you're supposed to say, you're dressed in all the right garments, you got everything wrapped around you perfectly. But there's just not an assurance. But what does the writer of Hebrews say? No, no, no. Now, you can, you own the place. Right? You can walk in boldly because you have been forgiven. You're clean. You're cleansed. Because of what? The blood of Jesus. The sacrifice that has been made. And here's, the, here's what I think Hebrews is telling us. Listen, if you have accepted forgiveness, stop whining about your life. Stop whining about what's going on and start walking boldly. Because the way has been made. The Bible says that when Jesus surrendered his life, that the veil in the temple, that curtain, which was thick, was torn right into, and now access to the most holy place, to the very presence of God, is available to all who have received his forgiveness. Because now there's something greater than the law, greater than the sacrifice. It was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And now we have a high priest, the Bible says. And since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. Go right in. That's a very different picture than I think would have been happening with the priest that day. Go right into the presence of God. How many of you have a door on your house? How many of you shut that door most of the time? Let's just say most of the time. How many of you have people that come to your house and they knock? Right, and you look and you go, oh, door to door, nope. <laughs> I'm just gonna stop the joke there. You know where it's going. We're in church. <laughs> and then you have some people that they don't knock, right? They come up and they, and they walk right in. Right, do you have people in your life that do that? Like a spouse, maybe? <laughs> you make your spouse not. Come on. It's not funny anymore. Stop changing the locks. 
Or you have older kids, grown kids, that when they come visit, like, they don't knock. If it's unlocked, they're walking right in, right? Like, they own the place. They immediately go to the refrigerator. They go find your wallet, you know. They own the place. You have friends who are close friends, and they walk right into that presence. They walk right into the presence of your home. Why? Because they know they're welcome. Because they know they're welcome. Because you have made that possible. See, Jesus has made it possible for us to walk right into the presence of God because we are welcome. Because we are forgiven. When the blood of Jesus Christ is sprinkled on us, metaphorically, we're not going to line up and do that today, okay? But when we are covered by that, that offering that was made on our behalf, the Bible says that when God experiences us When we are in God's presence, it's not us, but we are covered. We're clothed in Christ Jesus. So we stand before God forgiven, free from the curse of sin and death. And so God wants you to walk in there boldly because who you go to and how you go there says a lot about who you trust and how much you trust them right? You go to that house and you're that person who walks right in there. There's a measure of intimacy. There's a measure of knowledge. There's a measure of who you know. You go up and knock on the door and you're waiting. Well, that tells you a little bit about how much the people inside the house trust you. That tells you a little bit about that relationship. And the same is true for us. So practically speaking, God is saying, listen, Christ's work that he has done for you has opened up this incredible doorway for you to go and be in his presence. So what does that look like? It looks like Man, get in it with God. Like, wake up in the day and start talking to him like he's there because he's there. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. Do I think there are moments where we need to find our time and get alone with God and have that, like, just devoted time? Absolutely. But more so, in your life, you need to start acting like he's there. In the middle of your day, you need to be praying in your mind, talking to God about your day, what's going on, your kids. Practically speaking, Boldly enter into God's presence every day. When there's something going on at work, talk to him about it. Like, who do you talk to first? Well, I, let's Google it. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Google's great. And, 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 and I'm, I think, you know, this idea of, well, I just need to go talk to the pastor about it. But don't do that here. I'm going to tell you what right now. You have seen me. You will just walk out feeling terrible about yourself. <laughs> like, that was the worst waste of time. You'll probably think about switching churches, you know. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't times for that, that God won't say to you, hey, go talk to so-and-so or read this article or go talk to a pastor and see if they can help you understand. Nothing wrong with that. But you have the great I am right there, right there, right there with you. And we just bypass that. Like God Almighty created the universe. Just hang on a second. I need to go talk to my (laughs) sister-in-law. I don't know who your sister-in-law is. I literally just thought of that right here on the spot. But like that's the idea. Like, you know, this God who created you is the first stop. His presence is the first place to go. Are you doing that? It's not church. It's like, oh, I can't wait till I get to church and I can talk to God about it. Like, what? That's part of the problem with the space that looks like this. It's different than every space that you go to. Like, not many places do you go sit in pews, right? One of the things we think about is, oh, the church is this special place. It's this sacred space. Well, I'm here to tell you my opinion of that is not very high. (laughs) Because I happen to believe that because of the cross and this new covenant, that the only sacred space on this planet is the human heart. That's it. And wherever you go, God is with you wherever you go. So I want to encourage you, before you walk into work, before you get in that car, before you go to bed at night, imagine God walking in front of you. And imagine him right there with you in your cubicle. Imagine him right there with you, wherever your work takes you. He is present with you. It's a matter of us accepting that reality and just learning to converse with him on a practical level. Okay, so the writer of Hebrews goes on and says this. Our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood. Again, this is not like, this isn't like like true, real, like it's true, but that that came out wrong. Uh, This isn't real life like they came and and they they captured Jesus' blood and they sprinkled him with it, right? I mean, this is a metaphor reminding them of what was happening in the other sacrifices, that the blood of these goats and lambs would be sprinkled on the people. 
the blood of these goats and lambs would be sprinkled on the altar. And it was this way of, of saying, okay, you've come and you've done your time. You've paid your dues. You're good for another day. You're good for another year. Because no, we've actually, our consciences have been sprinkled with the blood of Christ and now we're clean and our bodies have been washed in pure water. So this is going back to two very important parts of the Jewish faith. One was the mikvah. Everybody say mikvah. Everybody have a mikvah in their house? It's like a, a, a religious bathtub. Anybody got one? <laughs> No, that's surprising, right? We, we don't have this, but this was a ritual bathing. This is where you would go, and, and if you encountered a dead body, or if you touched something you weren't supposed to touch, or, or all kinds, there's a whole list of stuff, you would have to go and do this ritual bathing to be clean before you went into any temple area. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, well, you've gone through baptism, and you have been purified with pure water. And it's not the blood of goats or lambs anymore, but your conscience has been sprinkled with the blood of Christ. So now you can have this boldness. And what I think the writers of Hebrews is saying to us here is, you have to learn to love the blood. And we don't talk about blood because it's kind of weird. And if you're new, it's like, oh my gosh, all this blood talk, it's crazy. I get it. But when we understand the story of redemption in Scripture, we know that blood is very important. And, I, and blood is pretty important today too, right? How many of you got blood pulsing through your veins? How many of you would like to keep it that way for a few more days, right? Life is in blood. Blood carries oxygen to the organs and oxygen to the brain. It is life-giving. And see, the blood of Jesus Christ is eternal life-giving. And, and we cherish that. And so I want to encourage you on a practical level, like hold tight to that. Hang on to it. That reality that, man, this sacrifice was so important. Like, I, 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 there is something about this reminder to keep in front of our minds that the blood of Jesus Christ is precious. And that blood was shed. And the ultimate price was paid. And because of it, I have found forgiveness and I am now motivated to live differently. He says, so since we've been sprinkled with the blood of Christ and, and since we've been purified with pure water, he says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. Hold tightly and don't waver for God can be trusted to keep his promise. What does this mean? He's saying, listen, you have this blood of Jesus Christ. The hope that you have is eternal life. Like that is the hope. Like Christ has made the way. He's paid the price. And so you need to hold to that tightly. Some of us don't hold to that tightly. We don't hold tightly to the hope of eternal life that's in Christ. Why? Because we slip into doing mode. Well, I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to make God happy, and I got to go here, and I got to do this, I got to give, I got to do all these things. He says, no, 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 no. Hold tightly to this reality that the work has been done in Jesus Christ. And let that bring an assurance to you. Stop running from God when you make a mistake and realize you've already been forgiven. Be reconciled. Find grace and the power of grace that it is not of yourself so that you can't boast about it. It is all the work of Jesus. The writer of Hebrews goes on and says, let us think of ways then to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. You notice what he said here, let us, let us, let us. He's being very practical. Let us do these things. Let us motivate one another to acts of love. That's what, that's what my role is here. Do you know that? Like my job is to motivate you and part of your job is to motivate one another to acts of love. That's why we have these boards up on the walls. That's why we have the pray, care, and share boards because I'm trying to motivate you to acts of love outside of this building. And then we've got these other boards up that have these little tags on it because those are opportunities to volunteer and I'm trying to motivate you to acts of love inside of this building. And I don't think I'm asking too much, to be honest with you. I think some of you are lazy. Yeah, I said it. Yeah. I think some of us in the room are just lazy. We love to make excuses for why we don't serve. We love to make excuses for why we don't give of ourselves to one another. Just, oh, I'm just so busy. Yeah, join the club. I just, it's just inconvenient. It's just inconvenient. Okay, it was kind of inconvenient to hang on a cross too. I hate to break the news to us, right? 
I mean, I'm here to motivate you. And sometimes motivating us is getting a kick in the pants. It's like it's time for us to mature and grow up and realize our life is not our own. I say, well, Ryan, I live 40 minutes from here. This is such a great church. I drive 40 minutes to come to church. I just can't get here any earlier. Then you know what I would say to you? Go find a different church that's closer to home. I mean, I love you and I want you to come here. It's great. But more important than the number of people that come to this church is are you growing and are you building God's kingdom and are you able to be a part of a community? Are you able to love one another? And there's a good chance that if you're driving 45 minutes an hour, you're passing 12 probably pretty good churches on the way here. And again, that's, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just trying to be real. That God's called us to motivate one another. So whatever the excuse is, stop making it. Get involved. Love one another. We serve one another. That's the point. Like, once you've been around this place for three, four, five months, like, you need to be involved. Like, you need to be involved and, and start allowing other people to feel Christ's love through you. To stick around and, and just to kind of receive forgiveness and just come and warm the pew, it's like warming the bench. Like, what's the point in that? Like, get in the game. Like, get involved, and a great way to get involved is to take opportunities like these first serve opportunities and do. It is impossible to be a follower of Jesus Christ and not a doer of his works. It's just impossible. And so I want to challenge you. Love one another tangibly. Get involved. And if you're not involved somewhere, figure it out. Easter is a great opportunity to serve one time. Here's the motto for Easter Sunday. We want all of our regular attenders to serve one and sit one. Serve one and sit one. So come out, serve one of our experiences, serve on Good Friday, serve on first service, second service, third service, serve on Monday night, and then sit in another service. Now listen, I am not unreasonable. I get it. Life happens. There are little kids. There are all these things, okay? So you all are smart people. You go to this church. You wouldn't come here if you weren't smart. I know that. But fine, just allow God to search your heart. Just do that for me. Say, search my heart, God. Am I, not, can, if I, am I not loving people inside the walls of this church? Am I not volunteering and serving and building up the body of Christ because it's uncomfortable for me? Or do I have a legitimate life season that just keeps me from doing it on a regular pace? And, and I'm not gonna here to condemn you for that at all. I'm here to allow God's spirit to hopefully convict you into this. Love one another. Love one another. Challenge each other to to love perfectly as Christ loved. And then here's the last thing, the last really practical way that we experience God's power, that we learn to trust him. He says this, oh, this is good. You thought that one was preachy? Oh, wait till this one happens. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. Are you a some people? You say, no, I'm here, Ryan. Ah! That's my buzzer noise. That means that's the wrong answer. This is not coming together. It says, but encourage one another. Encourage one another. Listen, you are encouraging me. I'll give you that much right now. Without you, this is very discouraging. <laughs> Having people listen is wonderful. But you're not encouraging one another by sitting here. You're being encouraged, which is good. Hopefully, <laughs> that's an assumption. I get it, sorry. But hopefully you coming, this is an encouragement to you and it's an empowering and equipping. But the reality is, the getting together that the writer of Hebrews is talking about, he's not talking about worship on Sabbath that they would do. He's talking about the gathering in homes that was taking place among people who were following Jesus. He was talking about getting with people in these smaller groups. What a brilliant segue into small groups. See, God has called you, if you have received his forgiveness and you want to live in his power and experience more than you could ever ask or imagine, to do it in the context of community. You and I have to prioritize community. And this in here is not community. Community happens where we know one another and we're known and we grow together. And so we've created this tier process. So you don't have to jump into a setting that you're completely uncomfortable. You can start with starting point. You can move into great expectations. You can go into the multiply group. So you can build yourself into the point where you've made those relationships and you can then be in a home team. Or you can jump right into a home team because you're one of those people who are relationally gifted and I don't like you anyway. You like to talk to people. 
I like to talk at people. That's why I took this job. <laughs> right? I mean, we're all different like that. But we make up our excuses again. I'm, I'm just so busy. I've just got my, got my kids. Listen, if it were important to you, you would do it. Can I tell a story, Chris? Is that okay, Chris? I don't want to embarrass you, but I'm going to tell a story about Chris. So if I embarrass you, deal with it. So Chris comes, my friend. Chris is in a wheelchair. Chris came for two semesters to my small group. My house is not handicap accessible. So you don't talk about inconvenient. Chris would pull up, get out of the van, get out of his wheelchair, drag himself up the steps on my porch, get his wheelchair into my house, wheel himself around my house, leaving dings everywhere. He just didn't care. I'm sending you a bill, Chris, for all that. Had to take this wheelchair, right? He was brilliant. He was brilliant. Huge part of the group. Grew in his faith. You want to talk about inconvenient? I'm sorry, but you can come up and give me a more great excuse than like, well, I'm in a wheelchair and you don't have a ramp, so I'm not going to go to small. Like, that's a pretty darn good excuse not to go to a small group. But he doesn't let him stop him. And we make up our excuses because we're afraid. We make up our excuses because we're busy. We make up all those excuses. And here's what we're doing. We're robbing ourselves of the ability to learn to trust. Prioritize community. Get into a group. I don't get paid any more or less money depending upon how many people are in a small group. I believe, however, that you will grow and that you will experience God in a special way as you prioritize community. Now, I get it. There's different ones. I'm not saying jump in one where you tell your deepest, darkest secrets. Which not, I'm not saying that. But how are you prioritizing community and, and getting to know one another and sharing your life with somebody else? That's how you're going to grow. It's not going to be in here. It's just not. It's going to be in the lab. This is the lecture. It's going to be in the lab. Those environments where you can just dig in and think and talk and get to know one another and pray for each other and learn how to pray and, and learn how to, to do some of these things in really practical ways. And here's what's going to happen when we do that, okay? When we prioritize community, when we learn to love the blood of Jesus Christ, when we, when we learn to walk boldly into his presence, bringing him with us into all of our lives, you know what we're going to get? We're going to get a stable mind. Some of us are very, very unstable. Like one day, Jesus is the best thing that happened to us, and the next day, who, who is Jesus? I want to encourage you, the stable-minded person is what God wants you to be, and it happens through the work of Jesus Christ. And it happens through doing these let us things that the writer of Hebrews talks about. So I think that's what was so powerful about all these stories we heard was that there was a stable-mindedness to it, that in the midst of some of those very, very awful situations, there was a stability there, that God is with me. Didn't matter what I felt. Didn't matter what around me looked like. I was stable-minded. God is my redeemer. God is my rescuer. I am forgiven and found in Jesus Christ. That's what happens when we start to live out these principles in Hebrews. And that's really God's power at work in us. And that's how we tangibly trust. There's lots of ways we can build trust. And, but here in Hebrews, we find some great things that, that move us in that direction. We're going to finish with a song today. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand up in just a minute. We're going to sing for about four minutes. Then we're going to sit back down awkwardly. All right? That's what's going to happen. That's what we do. And I get it, you know, so it's Okay. Because this is a song you just can't sit for. The reality is half of you are going to stand up because he's going to remind you of your childhood and you're going to be moved. And so the other people are going to think, should I sit down? Should I stand up? So we're just all going to stand in a second, okay? You know that happens, right? Let's just call it like it is. Like, why is that person standing up? Should we all? So we're all going to stand up. We're going to sing this song. And you probably might have heard of this song if you grew up in the church. If you haven't grown up, but you've never heard this song. But here's the song. It says, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Isn't that what this is all about, assurance? Isn't that what stable-mindedness is? Isn't that what the ability to walk through life is? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Like right now, it's just a shadow. It's a foretaste of what it's going to be like forever when I'm really known by God. And the fog is lifted. 
And this song says, I am basically an heir of salvation. I have been adopted by God. I can walk right into the house. I'm a kid of this great almighty king. I am a purchase of God. The Bible talks about us being purchased and redeemed, bought with a price, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This song is written on an interpretation of Hebrews chapter 10 we've been looking at. And I love this third verse. This third verse says, perfect submission In other words, I have set aside my will and I am submitted to God and all is at rest. The trials, the circumstances, the good, the bad, I'm at rest in the midst of that. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. What's that talking about? When Christ will return, I'm watching for it. I'm longing for it. I'm waiting. I'm looking above. I'm filled with his goodness. I'm lost in his love. Fanny Crosby wrote these songs, wrote these lyrics in, I think it was 1873. Think about this song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Think about this lyric, watching and waiting, looking above. Fanny Crosby was blind her entire life. And she wrote this song, This is my story. This is my song praising my Savior all the day long. Trust. Trust. We live out these things. So let us not forsake gathering together. Let us fall in love with the value of the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us prioritize community. And in doing those things, let us walk boldly into God's presence. And at the end of the day, let us live in a place where we can give all glory to God who is able to, through his mighty power at work within you and within me to do infinitely more than we might ask or imagine. That can be your story. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for this series. Thank you for the encouragement, God, that we receive from hearing about your mighty power at work. And Lord, give each and every one of us a story of your power at work within us, doing infinitely more than we could ever ask or think. Lord, help us to tangibly live out our lives practically trusting you. Give us that courage and that clear conscience to walk boldly into your presence. Help us, God, to treasure and value the blood that was shed on the cross. Help us, Lord, to not forsake gathering together. Help us to Look for ways to motivate one another to love and good deeds. And Lord, give us a story. And may the core of our story be how Jesus Christ rescued and redeemed us and gave us a purpose and a calling in this world. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.